control. I have control. I have control. Just like, well, no, we're not live. No, we're not. We're just recording. We're recording. Well, yeah. we're, it's live for us. It's not live for you. If you'd like to be a member of the studio audience, email Mike at bulletin.net. And I will promptly ignore <laughs> any type of request to come here and watch us do this. Or. Or. I mean, I guess we could have. It could be an attractive, large breasted female. Oh, that would be. That would be acceptable. I will. I will accept those terms. What about a a, 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 a handsome but large-breasted man? Yeah. Okay. I mean, like you know, <laughs> non-discriminatory. I mean, if he's a cool dude, you know, uh, you're right. You know, it's not his fault. He's got tits. Yeah. He's like. He's like. What Bob. if it's like Meatloaf? Yeah. Meatloaf. Oh, dude. If Meatloaf wanted to come here, I would totally. Well, he's not alive anymore, but I had never heard him sing the national anthem. Oh. My God! I don't think I've heard him sing the national anthem. It was a nineteen ninety. It was it was a video I watched. Nineteen ninety four All Star Game. He sang the national anthem. I was like, I, up to that point, Jimi Hendrix was my favorite national anthem. Mm-hmm. Up to that point, dude. Wow, like yeah. just wow. I mean, Meatloaf is awesome. Like I, Bad Out of Hell is probably one of the best rock albums ever created. It's one of them. One I mean it's it's like top 20 easy. Yeah, easily easily top 20. And it's like totally non like it's a non standard. Like mm-hmm. it's not like every other but like you know like the big rock bands and stuff yeah. but like he fucking rocks. Like well, and the thing gets me is like you never hear like when you hear conversations about best rock vocals. I don't think I've ever heard him be part of the conversation not one time. Uh, Dio, yeah. uh, Dick Dickinson, uh, you know, all these people, but I don't think I've ever heard his name mentioned. And I was like, I mean, I've heard he's got a great voice, but dude, he should be included in it. He should. Um, the thing is, he just he's non traditional, it's not rock and like it's not, it's not what people would usually no, consider rock, to be rock and roll. It's rock you know? opera, is what yeah, it is. So like yeah, operatic and mm-hmm. like organs and fucking you know pianos yeah. and yeah it's 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 kind of popish some of like but it was heavy yeah. it was you know like paradise paradise by a dashboard light is like uh see my problem with that with that is it it became such a standard at karaoke for couples to oh sing yeah it's terrible that it's like not again yeah not again stop right there yeah i gotta know right now yeah like just Oh God! Before we now. go any further, do you love me? Will you love See? me forever? Do you need me? You're singing Will along. Will you love me forever? Will you take me home? I don't know the rest. Yeah, but I mean, like it's it became like the standard. Like you just everyone that every couple like, oh, let's go up and sing this drunk. Oh yeah, you know. So yeah. uh, it's like uh, closing time or what? what yes, is? yes. Oh God, I hate this you know what we should do? I hate that song. I just thought so of this. Much. Instead of inviting uh, people over to the studio to be studio audience, which would be probably boring, in we should for karaoke. We should do a bulletin karaoke outing. That is brilliant, sir. Because you and I, yes. have a a penchant for yes the karaoke arts. Yes, yes. I just made that up. He did, and it sounded uh, right. Yeah, the karaoke Yes, it's like choreographical. Right. I don't know. Anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do that. We're gonna do a bulletin awesome. outing to some sort of karaoke bar, mm. um, or something. Yeah, yeah, we'll, like we'll make it happen. I have no idea. That'd where, be great for a study group, like a, like a study group. Yeah, I'm and, sure everybody. Wait, would... no, no, no. We don't tell them what we're gonna do. <laughs> oh, just make them show yes, up. Yes, make them show up and then say, okay, this is going to be um, laborious, and it's going <laughs> to be at night. And it's going to be tactically efficient. <laughs> Come with all of your nighttime gear and then throw them in a vehicle and go sink carry You know, I I would say we could probably have the first like 100% attendance of like a karaoke thing with night vision. Ooh, that would be funny as hell. Yeah, like put an IR filter on the on the monitor. Yeah, we could. Uh, this is happening, people. <laughs> this is happening. Look at look for it in a city near you. It would be so stupid. Um, <laughs> and I know a guy that would entertain all this shit. 
Who's that? One hundred percent. The guy I know. The guy that runs the bar that we used to go to and sing, and he has one of the best. He has one of the best karaoke libraries you've ever seen. One of the best karaoke libraries. Yes. Hmm. To the point where he has laser disc. Like that's how deep his archive goes. Like he has full on laser. Disc. I would make the argument that if if somebody hasn't upgraded their karaoke library to digitize, no, he has, but he has that too. But like he has like original. I know you can have laser that. disc yeah. with the videos. Uh-huh. Some of them are, are not safe for work. They're naked chicks on the videos. Oh like yeah, it is. He he has probably the best I've ever seen. Yeah. I, well, I I uh, I used to frequent a. His book's like that thick. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I used to frequent a uh, a, a bar in uh, South Boundbrook, New Jersey mm. called Southside. And they mm. had a they had a they had a karaoke guy. His name was Harry, and he would host Harioke. Harioke. Very, mm-hmm. very original. Uh he was great. He was he was one of the best karaoke like DJs. And he, of course, could yeah. sit like I'm like, this guy should be a yeah. professional singer, but um yeah. That yeah. dude, that dude was great. He had a great, a great song library. And, and you know what the worst part was? This was one of those fucking karaoke bars that people would go to because they know it's where good karaoke singers go. So you go there and you're like, ah, fuck. Like, <laughs> do I want it? Like, you know, you go there. How do a, I go at that? Yeah, you, that. Go, you go with a few friends. You're yeah. like, oh, well, you know, it's like, I'm just going for a casual good time. and Not like, here. No, And then like you get there and you're like, shit. shit. Yes. The fuck? Fuck. Well, there, there there was this one chick who who was doing um oh crap, tells her name. God damn it, it'll come to me later on. Anyway, heart, and she was nailing. And when I say nailing it, mm-hmm. I mean she was nailing it, and like all amazing. And I was after her every single mm-hmm. time. It's like okay, we're going from heart to Rob Zombie. Enjoy, people. Like, because <laughs> <laughs> everyone loves listening to Rob Zombie, right? Everyone loves Rob Zombie. If you don't love Rob <laughs> Zombie, there's something wrong with you. Thunder Kiss '65 is my favorite song to sing at karaoke, mm. and I nail it. Well, we're gonna see. We're gonna find out. Yeah, this is gonna happen, people. Yes, welcome to karaoke time with <laughs> Mike and Max. I know you came here for for info about training and guns and politics. Instead karaoke i don't think anybody comes here for those other things they probably don't yeah i mean i don't think anybody comes here much at well, all but <laughs> you but, never know yeah well you well, know what well, they, get, they to, get all of us yeah welcome to the burn limits podcast yes with mike and max sponsored by bulletin where you go for all your training needs people if you are not signed up for bulletin you're just Wrong. The yeah. other day, I went on yeah. there. I went on there to find find the classes attack responses bring into Sugarloaf in Pennsylvania. Right? So should be pretty. You know, there should be like you know, eh, you know, four or five. No, there's like fifteen classes posted between now and then. I was like, holy shit! Right? Yeah, it's awesome. Like, like guys, there's a lot like, of there's a lot of classes. There's like 193, <laughs> I think, at the moment. Unreal. So like, and more and more people are signing up. More and more trainers are signing up. Guys. If you're looking for training, it doesn't have to just be in the Pennsylvania area, but if you're looking for training, you should be on there. You should be registered. It is amazing. And uh, speaking of which, you know, Max mentioned it. If there is anybody that happens to listen to this podcast that is interested, we have tactical response coming up to the Sugarloaf, Pennsylvania area uh, Mm -hmm. in just a few short weeks uh, at the end of September. So let me just double check those dates. It's my birthday uh, is that Monday. Is it? It is. Which with this the thirtieth. The thirtieth. Okay. So the twenty uh September twenty ninth and thirtieth is no, sorry, September twenty eighth and twenty ninth is fighting pistol. Yes. And then uh or October first. No, sorry. Jeez, I can't Monday and Tuesday. September thirtieth and October first. Yeah, yeah, that one. God, I can't talk. <laughs> is uh, fighting rifle, and uh, I just found out that there's there's like twenty people in the fighting pistol class. Oh, really? So, yeah, it's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, make sure you check those out. They're great. Uh, I'm I'm hosting them up here. I'm helping them kind of uh, organize their the the class and get things you know the logistic stuff in place. I so, will be the range bitch. Yeah, Max will be there. If you want to see us, come see us at uh, the tactical response class at the end of uh, end of September. Classes and. 
uh, stay tuned. I already started talking to them about maybe some future stuff next year. So, yeah. Uh, and you know, along with tactical response, plenty of other trainers coming to the area. Great people. Um, we have Mr. Andrew Smirshek coming back. That's true. Yes. I don't know the dates off the top uh, of my head. I think it's the 7th and 8th of December. Okay. So all the way out in December. Yep. He's coming back out and he is doing a red dot pistol class mm -hmm. and, and pistol skills and a pistol skills class, which I've taken. Awesome. Um, so we love seeing Andrew. He was just up here for the muster. We can't wait to see him again. Um, I know Zach Bush is uh, scheduling more class in the area. Just check him out on bulleted. You know, that's where you yeah, can get all yeah. of it. But th definitely those classes are coming up. You should you should pay attention as well as all the other great trainers in the area. So and I mean, tack response hasn't been to Pennsylvania in over a year, I think. It's true. Yeah, um, I believe. So, like, if, you, if you're in the Northeast and, you know, you don't want to make the drive down to, to Tennessee, like, this is as close as they come at the moment. Um, so, guys, like, if, if you're not taking advantage of the opportunity, you really should be. Yeah, it's a – yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Uh, do you – oh, before we get any further, because mm. we're already, like, 10 minutes into the podcast – um, we should mention our sponsor. Yes. So the sponsor for tonight's podcast is Iron Pig Armament, which I'll probably insert a little thing there. I figured. Uh, maybe. But you know what? Maybe I won't because we could just talk about how awesome Iron Pig Armament is. Turtle's a great guy. We've talked about him a bunch on the podcast. He yes. is the biggest supporter of our channel. Yes. You should go support him. I mean, he's a great dude. Um, he is the re... I don't know if he wants that out there. Anyway. Um, yeah, well, you that, know, he's I, I, very... I'm, I'm he's, not... He, he has been beyond, beyond generous. Yeah, he's a um, huge supporter yes, of the training community, yes. and uh, we thank him a lot for I have a, I have a wonderful turtle, if you're listening to this and watching this, which if you're not... You should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have... There is a There is a care package that will be coming to you. I'm hoping by Tuesday it'll be mailed out. Um, that has some good stuff. If it's ticking or it smells it, like lubrication. It more than likely won't smell like lubrication. It shouldn't smell like vinegar because that'll be taken care of before it gets shipped. Oh, I know what it is then. No, you don't. Um, no? but, okay. but it has, it hasn't, it has a surprise in there that is close to my heart, but I know that it will be put in good hands. So if you're listening to this or watching this before your package arrives, hopefully it's a little bit of a teaser for you. I'll tell you off air. Okay. Well, you know. Anyway. Either way. Awesome dude. Fantastic go, guy. Go check out yes. ironpigarmament.com. Uh, and thank you for uh, for supporting the channel. Yep. Thank you for being you, dude. All right. So um, what, you want you want? should I do the, the rundown, the bulletin points rundown? Can you talk today? Can I talk today? Yeah. You want me to just... No, I want you to do it, but like you were saying a minute ago, like I can't talk. Oh, well, I can try. I mean, it's I think written you, out, I think so you'd it might be successful. Be, yeah. I think I, I have 100% faith in you, sir. Yeah. I, it gets easier each time, so I might it's not true. mess it up. All I right, here we go. Will. We're going to do it. Ready? For August 29th, 2024, these are your bulletin points. A Florida sheriff's deputy responsible for killing a U.S. serviceman in his own home faces a reckoning for his crimes. And details emerge about Trump's unsuccessful and enigmatic would-be assassin, including the possibility of him... Oh, I messed it up. Keep going. Uh, including him possibly just seeing the former president as a target of opportunity. These stories, training tips on zeroing your rifle, and a discussion on keeping your family prepared and getting them into training tonight on the Berm Limits podcast. Ah. You can't, when you're in the fight, you can't, you can't stop. You got to keep going. That's true. But uh, I just, I, I get, I get tripped up. <laughs> yeah. All well, right. Well, so you are carrying the the 100% load of that part of the podcast sir so yeah yeah the, the, i don't yeah there's we don't really trade that one off <laughs> no we don't um but yeah so we got we got a bunch to talk about tonight we do um first up we have our training tips training tip so uh you had brought this one up and i thought it was a good one 
And, uh, you know, I think, I think the way we think about training tips is if we, if a friend of ours or somebody that we know says, Hey, I'm going to go take X class yep. or I'm going to go do this. The training tips are the things that we would give them as those little sound bites of like, Hey, make sure you do this before you go or bring this thing. Or, you know, it's that, uh, that little bit of, um, a little bit of advice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we had some for tonight. It's kind of like, uh, related to what we were talking about before of people taking, say, upcoming classes like the tactical response classes. Like if someone came to me and said, Hey, I'm taking fighting rifle. What should I know? Yep. So what do you, what would you, what would be the first thing that you tell them, Max? Oh, well, I mean, talking about zeroing your rifle or just in general? Yeah. Like I'm taking, I'm taking fighting rifle. What's Make the, sure what? your rifle is zeroed yeah. at least to the point where it's on paper, because all it's going to do is just save you time when you get there. Okay. Like knowing, knowing where your gun is hitting, being able to be within a reasonable you know, marksmanship, a uh, group at 50 yards, I think is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Cause I think one of the things usually on every trainer's list is, uh, well, most, some of them do, and some of them don't specifically list out a zeroed rifle. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know some trainers actually take a lot of time in doing the zeroing process. Yeah. Uh, I took, uh, I took that Haley strategic class, uh, D five AK. And, uh, I, it was a three day class and probably, 40 to 50% of the class was actually spent on zeroing the rifle and then learning what that, like what your particular rifle does at different distances on different days with different, mm -hmm. different loads in it. So it all depends on the class, but you should really go with a zeroed rifle. Yeah. I mean, I've seen classes where, uh, they wanted you to come with a rifle with it unmounted. Cause that was part of the class. Like it was actually a part of the class to mount your optic. Oh, mount the optic. Mount the optic okay. zero and in, in the, the entire process. That was part of the process, but that is a rare exception to the rule. So I think if you go in there and you can hit, you know, within say a 10 by 10 space at 50 yards, I think if you go in with that basic ability, I think you'll be ahead of the curve. Yeah. What if, uh, what if somebody doesn't know how to do that yet? There's this thing called YouTube. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like, um, uh, your rifle should have – read the fucking manual. Your rifle will have a piece of paper in there. It could be a single. could be a little book. It will have detailed instructions usually on how to adjust the optic. What I'll say is if you don't if, – if say you're going to take a class and there's something on there that you don't um, – you don't know if you qual like if you have the right thing for it, just reach out to the yeah. to the to the school, the instructor, yeah. or whatever. Uh contact people that you know. Like, what does it mean to have a zeroed rifle? Um, because not everyone will know. I mean, and and a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are probably people that have been around the block a time or two yeah. on on classes. So uh you're probably gonna be those people for friends of yours that are going to, you know, going to classes for the first time. Um, so yeah, just, uh, just make sure that you encourage people to ask and, and talk about things. Cause you know, it's important to have a zeroed rifle. Not everyone understands that like, oh, you put those things on and you know, it's not just going to hit it, well, like you, and you have to, you have to stretch it out for, to know because, oh yeah, you can be within three yards with a, with a rifle and like, depending on where it's zeroed, it doesn't matter where it's hitting. Cause mm -hmm. you're, it, you're basically pointing and shooting at that point And there's not enough distance to actually see the differences in the different types right. of zeros you might have. Um, so you got to stretch it out. You got to do Here's a question for you. And this is something that, that I, I have done. Um, but I've gotten, I was, and it, the question is like, so you're going to a class, you're not, you, you're not shooting 77 green open tip match. Mm-hmm. You're gonna probably shoot 55 grain. Maybe depends on what you what. So, but it, let's say you're that person. You then have to rezero your rifle after class for whatever round it is that you're actually using in the in the rifle for go time. Well, um, perhaps. So what you're what you're describing is the difference in zeros between different loads, mm -hmm. right? So uh, a 55, like if we're using AR as an example, a 55 grain. Um, uh, projectile is going to have a slightly different, right. uh, you know, trajectory than say a 77 grain or something along mm -hmm. those lines. Okay. So I'm just spelling it out for the people. And the, uh, the really, when it comes down to it, the difference between zeroing at 50 yards between a 55 grain or a 77 grain is going to be a matter of inches at 50 yards. Right. 
So depending on the type of class that you're doing, if you're doing a precision rifle class, you need to make sure that that gun is zeroed for the load that you intend to shoot the class with. Right. If you're doing, say, a close in defensive skills class with that rifle, it's probably not as important to worry so much about the the difference between those two zeros. If you if you use different training ammo versus right. like it weights versus it, because or, because or, really the only difference you're going to have is probably an inch right. or so even out to 50 yards. Yep. And if you're not shooting past 50 yards, it's not like most people when they're doing defensive type drills standing. Yeah. An inch isn't going to nope. really make much of a difference at all, especially when you're talking about like combat zeros or combat mm -hmm. effectiveness between like basically hey, minute yeah, of yeah. man. Like, yeah. you know, if you're hitting the torso, like that's that's successful. Um, what I will say, and this is a good tip, um, make sure that if you do like have a gun that's zeroed for a specific load, um, make a big attempt to try and find training ammo that's in that load. Right. Like if you, if you're running a, a heavy grain bullet for like, you know, precision long range stuff in a certain gun, well, what's the point of using that gun for training? If you're not going to train with that gun as it's going to be in the long, like, you know, like if you basically saying you should, you should test yourself with that gun with the load that you're going to shoot because mm -hmm. that's the performance you're going to expect in the long run. Right. So like, it's okay to have like training 55 grain ammo and go time 55 grain ammo. Those are, those are going to have relatively similar mm -hmm. like trajectories, but, um, you know, the difference between a 77 grain and a 55 grain when you're reaching out to like 300 yards, that's a bigger difference right. than 50. I mean, I guess you could also, if you if you had a zero for your go time load, you could always count your clicks if you did adjust the zero you for could. class and write it down and then. And I then would return. actually, I would recommend learning holdovers. Right. Uh, and not adjusting your clicks. Because right. like once you get your optics dialed in for your, for the load that you intend to, for it to be zeroed to, it's much You'll 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 benefit more from just learning yeah. how to shoot with holdovers. Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, I need to hold an inch high at fifty yards right. if I'm if I'm shooting fifty five grains instead of seventy sevens. So, and that's once you start getting into longer range stuff, like anything with like um like a a mil dot reticle or an MOA reticle or things that are like longer distance type mm -hmm. guns, you're just gonna start like that's how that whole world works is by understanding differences in trajectories using MOAs or mills right. instead of like oh having the dot lined mm -hmm. up at a certain distance. So you just you gotta learn your holdovers. And this is where like a class like a Haley strategic class really does a good job at kind of teaching people fundamentals in the sense that you really learn the um the story, they call it the story of the gun, uh, of your gun and how that thing performs at five yards, 10 yards, 15 yards, 200 yards. Like you understand mm -hmm. where that bullet's going to hit based off of where your, your sight is. Yep. So it's good stuff. Cool. All right. So yeah, we've talked a bunch about, uh, our training tip already. Um, but a lot of things to consider before you go take a, before you go take a, a, a class. No matter, no matter what, like any 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 effort you put into that basic level is going to pay dividends once you get there because all it's going to do is allow you to not be as focused in on that task. You'll be able to be a little wider eyed to what's going on around you, which is always a good thing. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. So with that said, should we go and talk about our stories for this evening? Yes, sir. All right. You want to go first? No, you go first, sir. I got to go first? Yes. Why do I always have to go first? Because I went first last time. Did you? I think so. That's the way I'm remembering it. Somebody check us. I don't <laughs> think that's the case. <laughs> Please comment below. All right. So uh, the story that I dug up this week is an interesting one. Um, I don't know if you remember back in May, there was a, uh, there was a story of a man, uh, a, a U.S. Air Force serviceman. I don't know his rank, um, but he was shot in his home. In Florida, I heard the story. I did not know what happened in the home. For some reason, I had I was think I had heard vehicle. Yeah, um, this was a big thing. Uh, it's one of those other kind of like race racially charged type uh, type incidences. But um, I thought it was really interesting because I there was there's um, there's body cam footage out there of it, um, and it's a pretty interesting case in the sense that like it's a non standard. 
uh, thing that happens. It's not like the guy was completely unarmed. It's not like he was being aggressive towards police. It's somewhere in like that gray area. There's a gray area right. in between. I think it's a pretty clear cut thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll break down the, the details for you. Um, so the, uh, this all stems from the story this week of the deputy has been arrested. Like it happened in May, and he and he he just got arrested this week and charged with it, manslaughter. Wait, it took. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Um, so this was in uh, Walton Beach, Florida, on May third this year, okay, twenty twenty four. Eddie Duran is a Okaloosa, Okaloosa, Okaloosa County Sheriff deputy. Um, and, uh, he got a call and was responding to a report of a male and female arguing at, at like a, an apartment complex. God, they got to hate those calls. Yeah. Domestics. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so he, he, he responds on scene and, uh, there's a woman there who basically like says, oh, I, I don't, I don't know where the thing is. Like, I don't know who's arguing now, but. I know there's been, I've heard yelling come from apartment 1401 or whatever it is, um, in the past. So it's not even right now. Like (laughs) I've heard it come from there. So he goes, all right, well, that's where I'm going next. So he goes over to, to 1401 and this is the interesting part, which there was a lot of breakdowns on in terms of like, is this the right way to handle it? So he goes up to the apartment and like bangs on the door, pow, 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 and then says nothing. And moves out of the way of the door and like basically stands next to the door. Like, so he, so he's not <laughs> wait, seen wait, in wait, the peephole. Wait, wait, you mean like every home invasion video they've shown over the last two years? Yeah. Like if you're going to be super sketchy about knocking on someone's door, you would bang on the door and, and then get, move to yes. the side out of the side of the peephole. Right. So he does that. Pow, pow, pow. Moves out of the way of the peephole. Doesn't announce which is pretty much standard procedure, I believe, for all police is like if you're there on official business, you I'm have the to police. say, yeah, you are. You have to say you're the police. Um, about uh, thirty seconds later, he does it again, pow, 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 and then moves out of the way. <laughs> like so, in that time, um, the the gentleman who lived in that apartment, uh, his name's Robert uh, Roger Forston. Okay. Uh, he he hears this banging on his door, looks out the people, doesn't see anything, and apparently he's on like the phone with his family at the same time, like they're they're FaceTiming with him or something. Um, and the, he's like, I think someone's trying to break into my house, so he goes and grabs his pistol. He literally does anything, any the same thing any one of us would do. Right. Yeah. Like he grabs his pistol, goes to his door, and by the time he gets back to the door, he's got the pistol in his hand, not pointing it at the door or whatever. And he's he's trying to look through the peephole, and and that's when the 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 sheriff finally bangs on the door. Sheriff's department, open the door. So he goes, oh okay. So he's got the he's got the pistol down at his side, not in like a covert ready where it's like behind the small of his back, just like hanging at his side. Okay. Opens the door, and that's when uh, the sheriff's deputy sees him, yells at him. Move back. And and before anything can even be done, that guy draws his pistol out, shoots him six times in the chest. Uh, okay. No words were exchanged. The pistol was never pointed anywhere. Um, the guy opened the door, was yelled at to get back, and then he was shot six, six times in the chest, falls to the ground, and then the, then the police officer says, drop the gun. So... Okay, then. Yeah. It's... Um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> so so like that, and and like there's been a bunch of stuff since then where the police officers like I was in fear for my life, which is uh, may actually be legitimate. Like I'm not gonna say like that's something that only the person who says it can can tell you if it's true or not. But that has to be weighed against a reasonable every person. Every single thing he did was wrong. Uh, uh e- yeah, every single thing he did was wrong. If he was re- responding to someone that was known to be armed, I could understand stepping out of the way of the door after knocking. I cannot understand him doing that if there was no report of the man being armed. Uh, the fact that he didn't announce himself even the second time is b- bullshit. The fact that he didn't t- tell the guy to drop the gun 
whether he was in fear for his life or not is completely bullshit. Uh, everything about that entire engagement was wrong. Yeah, I mean, like, like don't get me wrong. I I understand it is a difficult like domestic abuse shit. Like you know you you're rolling up on a scene. You think that you know oh there could be a woman about to be killed or something along those lines. You're 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 amped up, but it's still your responsibility to act reasonably within being amped up. And he went to that apartment and you can make the argument that maybe he was scared and that's why he acted the way he did for all of that. But you, you're not allowed to be. That's like, still wrong. It's, you can't be <laughs> like, that, that's that, still then, wrong. Then you need to just stop doing yeah. that job. Like you need to be able to self check and be like, well, I'm not doing the job any Like I, I quit right now because it led to the death of somebody who acted completely like the rest of like every normal person should in the sense that he thought someone was breaking into his house. Now you could, you can make the argument too, that as soon as like, first off, he doesn't have to open the door. Nope. Like, and I wouldn't have, yeah, you could make the argument that he shouldn't have. You could also make the argument of, well, it's, it's, it probably would be common sense to not open the door with a, with a, a firearm visible. Uh, if you know that there's a police officer out there, like if you were able to look through that that peephole and see the cop out there and then you decided to open the door, you probably don't want to do it with a gun in your hand. At, you know, that's just the reality. You should you shouldn't have to do that. But likely you're going to you're going to make people really jumpy if you answer the door with a gun in your hand. Um, But he did. That's that. But he did nothing wrong. No. And he died. And, and he, everything the cop did was wrong. And I don't care if there was intention behind her. Like, I've gotten to the point where I'm so tired of – if you are putting a badge on your body, if you are putting a military insignia on your body, you are accepting the fact that there is a risk involved that could cost you your life. That is the job. It Maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe in a perfect world it wouldn't be. The reality is that is part of the job. You When you do that, there is an inherent risk – that you are acknowledging yeah. or should be. So this whole argument of being the scare, whatever, that is just, it, it's a combination of poor training and maybe poor choices of people to be doing the job. But like everything about that's wrong. Everything. Mm-hmm. It, the, the way he was trained, wrong. Well, it, you don't know that. But, but then he shouldn't have been. But if if I'm just saying, like you, you don't, don't make true. There's true, nothing true, in that story true, that says how he was true, trained. I'm just true. You know, God like, damn. I just want to. You know, he could just be a fuck up. I don't know. Like, uh, or there could be a systemic but approach, but we don't job. know that. We don't. Yeah. Know. Um. But anyway, that's um. Fuck me. It's so that's what happened back in May. This is the shit that that gets me though, because like, this was May third. Um. He was put on paid leave. <laughs> <laughs> between May 3rd and May 30th, I believe, at the end of the month he was he was finally fired. Okay, well I can see that. I could see them taking the time to do the investigation and maybe it took that long. Okay, fine. Maybe, well, I don't I mean a month? Like it okay, cuz let me make a parallel in a second. So, um he was like he was he was fired later that month, okay? All right. You know, okay, loses his pension. I know that's a big thing for cops, but you know what? People mess up and they lose their jobs. Yeah. Like that's what it that's happens. what should happen. And then August 23rd, like a solid, you know, 2 months after being fired, uh he was he was finally uh I guess uh, uh indicted for not for murder, for manslaughter. Okay, so he was arrested before that, then. Well, so indictment just means that uh, that's well, that what means they... grand jury said yes, go to trial with him, but he would have been arrested before that, right? No, not always. Okay, so if if it's a grand jury indictment, then the then the grand jury decides that he will be pro- like you know. That, okay, and then they arrest, and it, then they arrest it, him off it, of the warrant, but uh, supposedly, or he could have been in custody. I don't know, but it doesn't like he. Well, the story says that he. Um, he surrendered himself that day, like because the indictment came through. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, he gets a solid two months, you know, of not being um, yeah. indicted on on this type of thing. And uh, like the thing that just struck me about that is like, man, like even though it's pretty clear cut, there's video evidence of this guy improperly addressing the door, shooting a man who is not acting aggressive towards him like all of this like all of the clear cut evidence is there from day one because everyone can see the the body cam footage from day one 
And he's still given the benefit of the doubt for like, you know, three months from the from the the start of the incident. Right. And it's like, man, like if we did something, anything of that nature, like as civilians. Oh, like we would just be arrested the day of like, yes. and even if we weren't arrested the day of, it wouldn't take three months no. to get an indictment. It sure wouldn't. It may it take sh- three months for a guilty verdict. It wouldn't verdict. take, it wouldn't take 30 days for us to be fired. No. Like, and even if our employment had nothing to do with the incident, we would still be fired. We would still be fired because you know, that's the way the world works is like, Oh, well you got into a deadly accident. Well, we're going to fire you now. Like yes, that's how God forbid the company work for. Have yeah. Bad optics. We, we don't, yeah, we don't want bad optics. So it's like, it's the, the parallels between the two worlds are so stark. Um, and it's not even to say anything about like having to hold them to a higher standard. I just think that it's weird that we allow the world to work in a way where they get a different standard. Like, like a completely like, like we should all have to, follow the same rules yeah but and, and and on top of that like the other thing about that that gets me is like with all the critical views on police right now this is a clear-cut incident where they could have handed this up as this police officer did something wrong he's going to be made accountable for his actions mm-hmm. and they didn't do that well yeah i mean not not in a timely manner <laughs> no like i mean let's face it after a week is the news cycle even going to blurp about this? Well, this one was a big one because like, this the, the, this is one of those ones where I I don't know. I mean, I I don't want to like uh, this is purely speculative, obviously. Um, but it was one of those stories because the um, Robert Forrester uh, is that yeah Robert Fortson is is black. The cop is white slash Latino. I'm not sure. Like, you know, it's not super clear from the, from the articles, but, um, like there was immediately racial tensions because it's a black man who answers his door and a cop shoots him. And yeah, man, like sometimes you can't argue with like, yeah, like, cause would that have been the case if it was a white guy that opened the door? And I it, don't know. Like, I, and it's an opportunity. I mean, not that I'm saying it's the right way to spin it, but it, the, the police station could, the police, the sheriff's department could have at least used it as a say, Hey, we're going to, this was obviously wrong. We're going to take care of this. And it took them three months. Well, yeah. Cause they have to protect their own, which is part of the problem. Which I think, is a is huge part like, of the problem. It's the thing I harp on the most. If anything, terms- it should be the opposite. They should be ho- holding their own people to a higher standard. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I, I agree. And, um, it's, you know, I, I dare say that the world seems to maybe be moving in that direction, but not not because of like, you know, people wanting to step up about it. It's just that like good police and good people are like, you know, they're they're so hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> like and um like the the admittedly the burden on police is so much higher now and they're just under such scrutiny. Um, which I, I feel bad for people who have been really good at their jobs their whole career because I have I have family members that have, you know, been police for a long time. And, um, you know, I feel bad that they've had to, you know, kind of survive through a system that's changed and gotten more hostile towards them. But ultimately, in the long run, like that's needed, like as a social thing, as, yeah. a, as an overall thing, like we've needed to move towards a, a thing where cops are held more accountable and more responsible and uh yeah, it's just um, I, I think things are moving in the right direction or or maybe. But, um, you know, it's just one of the like, you know, it, it's it's another incident in a long line of like, yep. oh, OK, you know, p- you know, police mess up. And now we have to see how it plays out over the course of months. It, 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 yeah. But uh, but yeah, so that's a story. <laughs> <laughs> another feel good story from your friends here at the Barry Moment Podcast. Yep. That makes you just feel great about the world you live in, the environment you're raising your children in. Exactly. <laughs> that's why I don't live in Florida. <laughs> Andrew, you need to move to Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, we don't have. Well, we have sheriff's deputies here, but yeah, you I like. Don't, you I don't like, think they do the things that sheriff's deputies do down there. No, they don't. It, well, it depends, but no, they don't. All right. What do you got? Was the attempted assassination of president, ex-president, former president Donald Trump, a target of opportunity? That Tar- what is, is it? What, the story. So, what is a target of opportunity? So basically, low, low, low hanging fruit. It was, it was, it was something. Instead of it being, I'm going to kill Trump. It was, I want to kill either Biden or Trump. Trump happens to be here. He's and, the first one that shows up. Yes. Yeah. 
That's interesting. So now, granted, a lot of this information comes from the FBI. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Um, apparently, he he. I will not say the man's name. It's one thing that I I do agree. There's a couple other people say the same thing. I have no need or want to repeat the shooter's name. Yeah, I mean, like I like I think a lot of these guys are doing it just so they can become whatever in some way. And I feel I I agree 100 percent that they should be relegated to the forgotten holes of history mm. just yeah. personal i mean i i agree when i was reading through the story they, they mentioned his name quite a few times and like i would not i, I don't i don't ask i don't know his name i didn't write it down i didn't pay attention to it i ignored it completely um all i know him as is the shooter in that incident in okay so use use that yeah anyway so um he had apparently had done many online searches for not only rallies of trump but also biden mm-hmm um so he's an equal opportunity assassin? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, the FBI conducted over a thousand interviews and there was no clear motive. Like it, it, no one could give a clear motive as to why he did it specifically target Donald Trump. Right. Um, which leads more to the idea along with his online searches that this was just a target of opportunity. It, he had the ability to do it. He knew where it was. Apparently, according to his internet searches, um, once he heard the announcement or read the announcement of Butler, Pennsylvania, he fixated on it. Mm -hmm. um, he did a lot of searches on the grounds where it was going to be done, um, the buildings, the surrounding area. So like he, he had done quite a bit of research and fixated on Butler, Pennsylvania. Like He had made a decision that's where it was going to happen, but not necessarily that he was trying to kill Trump. Um, so I think some of the rhetoric, rhetoric of him being, uh, you know, liberal or any of those things, I think is probably bullshit. Well, he might have been. He might have been, but, but not. Like, it, yeah. yeah I, it seems like he's not so, like he wasn't necessarily like an anti-Trump extremist. Right. It just uh, like a lot of the things don't seem to add up no. to the to the what what people want the story to be. No, it, yeah. exactly. Um, also, he also had done quite a bit of research about the Democratic and Republican national conventions. Right. Well, I guess okay. with the idea of he was successful here, he was going to move on to or looking for other opportunities, opportunities or something. Yeah, because I I, I I can't imagine anybody stupid enough to think that they'll just get away. Like, <laughs> oh good. yeah, let me, I'll assassinate yeah. the president if, and be able to move on to yes. the Democratic national. If convention. you look at history, that has not been the case. Yeah, they usually um, die like they, very quickly. They, they, I guess, they did some kind of a profile on they. They found him. In, in the profile, he's highly intelligent and reclusive, um, and he had an eerie interest in explosives and violence and prominent public figures. Yeah, didn't they find um, – I think I read somewhere that they'd found explosives yes. in his house yep. and, and his, his car. car. Yes. Yeah. So the dude seemed like he was – he was he was out to yeah. to do shit, and the FBI is kind of frustrated because there was no clear like like line of I'm going I'm he was whether he was searching for targeting Democrats or Republicans. It sounds like he was just targeting public figures. Yeah. So a lot of like the rhetoric after the incident and all. Again, all these things are, are all these you know assumptions are made without any information. Um, but it sounds very much like he just wanted to either. Again, another reason why I won't repeat his name, become famous for what for doing it or, you know, whether it was just he hates the system. Who knows? It you almost know? it almost makes sense. Like, in, you know, because, you know, when you look back to these, um, well, some some of the some people who decide to, like, cause chaos and terrorism and stuff, they're ideal, like they have an ideology that yeah. they that they're working towards or following. But, you know, I think. It, the some of the ones that jump into my head are like countercultural like it did like um Harrison Klebold from from Columbine mm -hmm. or um some of the other like the Parkland shooter or, or like you know, like all when you hear the the stories and like the background of these these you know truly awful people that just want to yeah. cause harm there's there's such a loose grip on like ideology and it's just they just want to hurt yeah. they just want to, they just want to kill they just want to rack up the body count they just they've decided that that's their their mission in life so and i mean and, I think and that's hard to it's hard to wrap your head around because people want to see such a uh they want to identify with an ideology they want like it's an easier story for me to digest if like you know and i'm not i'm just making an outlook like a a, a 
a um, a generalization here. It's like, okay, if I'm a conservative and like I have a conservative candidate and that conservative candidate gets shot at or almost assassinated, that person that did that has to be the other team. Exactly. And that fits into people's brains a lot easier than, oh, well, then this that dude just wanted to hurt everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, that that doesn't make sense because it's way easier for me to hate those exactly. other people, the blue team. Fuck them, you know? And I think like it's one of the things about about the shooting in particular was, you know, I remember listening to the audio of it and being surprised at how many shots were 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 taken by him. Um, because it just it made that nothing about it made any sense to me. Seeing the pictures of the location made no sense to me. Um, the, the videos that came out afterwards, um, the people claiming there's somebody over there, all, all the things that didn't make. Oh any, yeah, there's you know. So I'd love to get somebody who knows. Oh my god! Like you know, like like executive protection, security stuff to like like break down that stuff with us and like on a, on a podcast, yeah. because like there's so many, like as a layman, just somebody who's been, Oh yeah, I've gone through like a, a executive protection class, which isn't that type of executive protection, but like me looking at all that stuff going, this is so stupid. Yes. What is like, why is all of this seem wrong? Yes. Like, um, it's, as soon as you start seeing a little bit behind the veil, you realize like how absurd some of the shit is that's going on. I mean, that. I pretty much, I feel pretty much like if that had been an exercise, call it an exercise <laughs> and you had taken the class and that was your final dr final like drill you would fail I, I don't know anything about that that was seen as 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 a good job like nothing well, nothing i would say that probably the, the 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 high marks goes to the sniper that that split the dude's dome open for like, sure like there were shots fired that guy put two hits on target within a yeah. couple of seconds when he it was only him and like a limited other number of people that were that were looking at like yeah. rooftops and and potential targets. However, <laughs> you can then break that down and going, well, why wasn't why? somebody looking at yes. that rooftop for a the very entire long time, time beforehand? The entire time. I mean, how long was the speech? Twenty minutes? Thirty minutes? Hour and a half? Yeah. So it's you sometimes can't go like that. Sometimes it's hard to break down because like who knows if that if that guy that sniper's job was to cover that sector. Now you can make like, but so I don't know, but I'm saying like, if anything, there was a good response. In, well, he 100%, like, if you watch the video, he required, like he was not like, again, this is video from far away. I'm not an, anywhere near an expert, not even close to it, but it definitely seemed like he was watching an area, heard the shots, went like this and then reacquired. I don't yeah. think he was, he had his gun pointing in that direction at all. Yeah, maybe not. So, I, so having to point a high magnification scope that quickly and made a headshot. Well, I, I think he made two well, actually, but, but that's yeah. pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know the specifics, but I would say, like, if I could look at that metric of yeah. hey, there's shots being fired from an unknown location to them addressing where they're coming from and then stopping the threat yep. that happened relatively quickly. It's yes. the seven shots that the guy got off beforehand that you go, well, that it all happened in very rapid succession. Um, so yeah, I mean like there's just, there's weird shit that happened that yep. day. There's things that looked really bad. Um, and unfortunately a man lost his life and, yeah. and from, from all accounts, an excellent man lost his life. Yeah. I think that's, which is the friggin' tragedy of it. Well, absolutely. I mean, quite uh, honestly, I mean, not to, Again, this goes into into the idea of your take you're accepting certain responsibility, certain dangers. If you run for head office, you're accepting the fact that there are people that are gonna want to put a couple ounces of lead through you. Mm. So like that's an interesting one. You know what I mean? So like the only person there that was not taking on an inherent risk were, were the people in the crowd. Not the not 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 the Secret Service members. Not the shooters, not the bad guy, and not Trump. Well, I can make the argument that going to a political rally for such a true for, true. for such a highly yes. good point, like you know, contested figure as Trump mm -hmm. is also accepting a certain level of and risk. sitting behind him. Well, you don't know where behind <laughs> is relatively, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. um. You know, yeah. don't go to stupid places and do stupid. Like, I, I personally believe, like, 
political rallies for po- for 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 figureheads are stupid places because there's no need to be there. No. And um, some people feel that um, that need to yep. be anyway. That's a whole nother topic so anyway, of discussion. So but I didn't mean to like sideline. Yeah, yeah, but but, but but like it's it's interesting to see how little you know clearly defined stuff is coming out about this this guy who tried to <laughs> yeah. shoot, tried to shoot Trump. Like it's. It's weird. Got it's a lot of info on his rifle. Oh, really? Thank God. What was oh, yeah. he shooting? He was shooting a DPMS, an older one, and it looked like he had a hollow and Ames. What that squared? Oh, off really? It. Yeah. Like, like one, like an open emitter yeah, optic. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. The the new that new one that they came out with that was closed emitter. Oh, oh, one of the newer ones. Yeah. Hmm. The one that had the had the sacrificial windows. Yeah, on it yeah, or whatever. I know yeah. what you're talking about. It looks like a. It looks like it looks like that on a. And I think they say it was like a, his father's DPMS AR-15, hmm. which is, you know. Well, you know, it's, it, you know, 140 yards or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not a, it's not an easy shot with a moving target. Like the fact that, that Trump's alive is crazy, um, <laughs> especially when you look at the angle stuff. It literally and, was doing this. Yeah. And he just turned his head and, and that's a, the and only he, reason he's alive. So I listened to, um, we're going on and on about this, but he, I listened to his interview with Sean Ryan. So he, Sean Ryan interviewed him. Yeah, yeah. In Vegas. And he was talking about it and he said, I tried watching it. Okay. He turned to look at a chart Uh that he was talking about. Yeah. And it had something to do with jobs or whatever. Like, like it was like that was that was what he had done. That 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 was the movement of his head. Yeah, I like Sean Ryan. Um, I I can I can only handle listening to Trump talk <sighs> for like thirty seconds, and then if it's an hour, it loses his, yeah, if his it's charm. An, if it's an hour, he said about twenty five minutes worth of stuff because <sighs> he has a tendency to just he just repeats everything, yes. and it's it it's all just like this kind of egotistical mumbo jumbo bullshit. But either way, um, anyway, yeah, it's I saw that I saw that pop up. And I was like, "Oh, well, that's a that's I just a big think get. that's a big think, get for the Sean Ryan podcast." Yeah. I just think it's hilarious that you know they they have detailed information about the rifle, but not about the man. That just, that's the part that just gets me. Yeah. But all right, well, you know, more more enigmatic stuff. Always, always leaving you feeling good. Yeah. No answers here on the Berm Limits podcast. Just questions. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cool, man. So. Those are our stories for this evening. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not really a big, like a, it's not really a natural segue into what we kind of decided well, to be our uh, discussion topic. True. I mean, it's a segue kind of sort of not really from the training tip because uh, it involves training, but. Well, I'm just saying from, from the stories, there's really. Well, no, no, no. I'll put it to you this way. Um, for the people that were involved that were having to react to shooting, I would say this is very, very much a a relevant topic. Well, I guess you could say that. So we decided that the topic this evening was going to be how to get your family um, and loved ones into training mm-hmm. and helping them, like which which also leads to um, Prepared. preparedness yeah. and just being more generally aware and. Um, like coaching them into being more like, you know, mm-hmm. like-minded with us. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying you're not like-minded with your spouses and the rest of your family. I'm just saying, you know, not everybody's family is all gung-ho on the training thing. But those types of incidences, I think, yeah. are a good way. Like, you know, like the tr- like Trump getting shot, like those types of things. Like, man, I think that helps bring it home to people of like just how close we can be to – uh, crazy times, yep. just how close we can be to large scale or, or public, um, public acts of violence that you can find yourself in with your family. Uh, I think all of those help bring it home for, for I mean, that I mean, conversation with yeah, your, I mean, even, with your loved ones. even the idea of like, if let's say this had happened, say in a city and you know, there was a rush of people like, <laughs> You and your family being on the same page about like a simple thing like having a word that if you say this word, there's no questions, there's no, there's no doubt. We are going, you are, you are following me. We are going here. You are going here. Um, this means we need to not talk about this. We need to not have a discussion. We need to move now. Just a simple thing of that conversation. If that had happened in a city for a family with a couple small kids. Like that could be a real problem if if you didn't. Yeah. Well, I I think that's there's a there's a few things to break down in that 
that kind of tip because yeah. it, it's great. Like I have one of those with my family. Um, by the way, you should not share what no. yours is with anybody unless you like, you know, that you consider someone to be part of your family just because, and it's not, it's not so that so much that they like, Oh, they know your password. It's just so that you can still be discreet, um, amongst other people so that you don't tip your hand. But, um, I think that's probably the first area that I would probably hone in on is communication. Yep. Like, ugh, like nobody wants to communicate, like especially like honestly in a relationship like that's the hard shit you know like this so, is why everyone doesn't like communicating with me because <laughs> there's no filter none none there's none no i'm max's filter for yes. all of you you like, you have you, no yes. idea <laughs> you, um you, you're you are getting the benefit because my thought stream <clears throat> just comes out raw Raw is a good word, <laughs> um, and not raw like Eddie Murphy raw. Like no. that's a good type of raw. No. Raw like you know, like uncooked pork, <laughs> um, or like a chafing mm. type of rawness. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, good chafing. Yeah, but um, no communication is, I think, the 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 part where you start because um, honestly, you'll never get anybody in to training or to help coach them into like sharing your your goals if you don't tell them yep. what they are like um i've had that conversation with 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 jamie and like you know it's part of like i've evolved who i am as a person since we got married since we started like shit we've been dating or we started dating 20 well, it was in 2000 yeah it was like 19 years ago mm. um so like I'm not the same person I was 19 years ago. You're not? No. Like not mean, even close. You mean like, you've changed? Like there might be some core values that haven't changed. Like I'm still, still likes Billy Joel. I still like Billy Joel. I'm still a Boy Scout at heart. <laughs> but like there's there's a lot that I have changed in terms of like my priorities, like how I view family and um like protection and and what I what I want to learn and 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 provide for for the people around me. So like um that has all had to be communicated, mm -hmm. like what the goals are. So, and you have to be on the same page and like, you don't always have to agree, but you have to have the respect with each other to be like, okay, well that's important for you. I respect that it's important for you. Maybe it's not as important for me, but I will, I will go buy it for you because you like, I value you. Like, mm -hmm. so like, um, you have to you have to start there. And that that has like that's not even to anything to do with this world or prepping or um or training. That's just relationships in well, general. Like you have to be able to communicate. I mean, that's the basis of I mean, there's two basics to a healthy relationship. Trust, communication. That's it. If you have those two things, that is a foundation for almost any relationship, whether it's a friendship, a marriage, uh being a parent. Uh, work environment, whatever it is, if you have trust and you have communication, you're doing better than probably most of the people mm -hmm. that walk the earth. Um, and I agree 100% because it's it's tough because you take something like, say, fighting pistol. When you come back from that class, there is a mind dump that you want to pour into everyone you love and you care about. That's true. Because yeah. it's there's you're fed a fire hose. Um, and well, it's like, I wouldn't even, th there's a lot of information, but I think more so than the fire hose, you are fundamentally changed. Yes. Like, and, and even if you don't remember all the stuff that, that you've been taught from a lecture or like the, the skills from a, from pistol shooting or whatever, um, well, like, there is a, I, there is a point when you get into training and I'm sure many of the people that listen to this have, have felt it where you feel like you have. You you at your core you've now instantly changed as a person, right? Um, and that's the thing that you want to share with everybody. But there's a caveat to that because that's assuming you went in there with the open mind. It's assuming that you went in there, yeah, and you actually course. heard. Well, because yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of people that have taken that class and bought the gun and it's still sitting in their safe and they haven't touched right, it. Right, but we're not talking about right them exactly because they don't care about getting their families exactly. into training. We're exactly. talking about the people that yes. have had the the epiphany yes. the 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 kind of monumental shift the the realization that oh it is important for us to do this stuff yep. um and now i need to 
exemplify uh, or, or not like exemplify being that person that I want to be for those around me, but also try to convince other people to mm-hmm. now change their ways. And you've kind of, it's sometimes you you feel, I mean, you do feel like an evangelist. Like you do in the beginning, you 100% do. Because, oh my God. I, I, oh my God. I still cringe at the fact that I was like Mr. Gun guy for yeah. so long. Like I try in social situations now where I'm not in training environments or around friends that do this stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't, and even with friends that do this stuff, we don't talk about guns anymore. But man, I that, that's all I talked about for mm-hmm. a long time. Um, and training, and it's, it, was, it was over the top because it was so cool for me. Um, and it's I'm still known as that guy. And I'm like, man, I don't talk about that stuff anymore. Like, unless somebody asks me a question, mm-hmm. and then usually people don't like me answering questions <laughs> no, anyway because there's because they don't want to hear the answer. No, well, it's. <laughs> Because I've been doing this so long and there's a very definitive response to it and I have absolutely no care about like the nuance to it. It's like, well, what gun should I get? You should get a Glock 19 or a Sig P365. What what about a car? I'm like, I don't, you can get whatever the fuck you want. Yes, you should, you should get the Glock 19. What a, yes. But you asked me the, like, and it's like one of those things where it's like, you've been asked the same question a million times, but, um, I don't know. (laughs) Like it's. (laughs) 357 two shot yeah. Derringer. Go. <laughs> right. Um <laughs> and like and, and, and to the point of communication, those are also the people that are kind of lost to you in the like they they don't know. Like they don't understand that like um like if 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 people just as much as communication's important on the on the um the talking side, mm-hmm. the the giving side if you will, like it's it's Sometimes it's also important to recognize that, like, there are some people that aren't going to listen. And are, some aren't ready to. Yeah. Like, like, the reality is, is that one of the things that, that James said, I was very lucky that I got a live lecture from James, my first fighting pistol. Um, and one of the things um, that he said is that some people aren't ready to face their own mortality. And I think to... Do what we do and to truly understand where we're at and and all these things, you have to face your own mortality. And and there are some people that are not ready to do that. Yeah. Well, and and it might not even just be mortality, although that's that's a big part of it is like a lot of people live like the ostrich with their with their head. Yes. In the well, and ostriches don't do that, by the way. They don't put their heads in the sand. But hey, I watched a lot of. Of cartoons. I know the cartoons and, and, lied to us, and they did not lie. <laughs> I have decided there are certain things. Coyotes are indestructible, and um, Roadrunners are absurdly intelligent. I've heard that coyotes are definitely not indestructible, and I would like to go destruct some <laughs> of them at night. Uh, I would love to do some depredation yeah. hunting. Ooh, that sounds like a, that if sounds anybody in Pennsylvania fun. has a has a hookup with a place or people to do like night vision coyote hunting let me know um or we could just come to your neighborhood just don't tell your friends <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah like anyway. like some people have their head yes way down that hole in the sand and um as important as it is for us to get the message out sometimes it's you know you got to learn to cut bait on on people and i'll be honest like that's a hard that's a hard thing to like recognize. And I, I'm very thankful that I've never had to do that with say somebody that's as close to me as a spouse, but I've heard stories from people where like you, sometimes you have to do that. Like, and it may not be just because you couldn't get them into training or prepping or whatever, but like, if you can't communicate with them, if the relationship isn't there, you have to, sometimes you have to recognize that and go, okay, we're cutting bait on this uh, and I'm going to start somewhere else. Um, the, n- all the people in my family. Well, yeah. No, I'm just saying, like, like it. My mom has eight sisters. There is probably close to 200 people that started from two people, between marriages and children and everything, and like, yeah, you know, it. That's. I, I actually had a very intense phone call. You know, early on with James about that because I was like, I don't know how I I didn't know how to rectify this. Like, I, I don't know. I, I was so so torn. He said, "Call me," you know, and and that was a phone conversation. I was like, I I don't know. I don't know where to take this. Um, yeah, you know, he gave me very good advice, and and it, it's held up. But like, yeah, like you know, if if you have to, whether you want to or not, after what 
cut bait. Oh, like, okay. like, like, yeah. like, like sometimes you have to. Like, like these yeah. these people are never going to be a benefit for you and your family. These people are only ever going to take or only ever going to be a detraction or or a distraction. Um, and for the benefit of your family circle that you have, sometimes it's what you got to do. Yeah, and. You know, a lot of people view the world in too much of a black and white situation where if it's like, oh, if you're if you don't consider someone to be in your family, then you consider them to be an enemy. And that's just truly not the case. It's just, yep. you know, um, not not giving too much of yourself away yeah. to people that aren't going to appreciate or reciprocate in some way, shape or form. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, well, I gave you X, so I deserve what that's not how the world works. But if you're if you're like giving yourself and and your time and energy and love and you know like commitment to people and they don't reciprocate that in some way shape or form back to you then that's it's a one way relationship yep. and one way relationships are just not um they're not healthy yep so um it's 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 understanding that like you know figuring out who is the right people to to focus on in your life but also, even if you do find the right people to focus on, the people that do care about you, sometimes you you will find that if you're open and honest and communicating and, and doing all the things that you're hoping to do and change your life, that you may come across somebody that you deeply care about that's like just not going to be on the same page. Yep. That's a hard – I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what the answer is to that. You, you I know? think – I mean, it's it's like you know you know you hear the the statement of my bags are packed. Like there are people, that literally, there are bag my bags are packed. Like they're bags that are packed. Like if they had a problem and they said, "Hey, I need you now," it would be like, "Okay, Roger, Roger." Um, and you know, I think there are some people that you know, even if they are diametrically opposed to your lifestyle or, or what you're doing with your family or whatever, I think as long as they are not constructed intentionally trying to destruct what you're building if they're not intentionally trying to take from you um even if they're opposed to what you believe or whatever the case would be i think there's still value there yeah i you know it, but again like it's 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 such a subjective thing and it's 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 an impo it's an impossible con conversation or an impossible answer to find you know the only person who can figure it out is the person that's involved yeah like like for instance if you're um, if you're a guy who's really into this world that wants to prepare and do all this other stuff, you know, I, I can't say you're always going to find a way to, 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 to get your, your spouse into like thinking the way that you do mm -hmm. or getting, getting involved. Um, and that's, that's fine. Like that's, that's totally like, it's not, that's not a, a deal breaker. I think the deal breaker would be if they're actively pursuing ways to dissuade you yes. from being who the best person is for you. So mm -hmm. like, um, it's totally fine to be, Hey, I respect in what you're doing. I encourage you to do what you need to do. I'm it's just not my thing. Right. Like I know a lot of people that, that are very much in that camp and they have, you know, okay, you know, it's not cutting bait. It's just saying, well, I'll, a lot of the burden on the preparations falls on me. And I mean, at a certain point you have to be willing to accept that like, well, okay, based off of who we are, what we, what we agree to together is like, we're going to be at a certain level of preparation that isn't going to get much higher. Yes. That's okay. But, um, but yeah, so, yeah. so we know we've, we've identified like, okay, what if we can't, Okay. but, but what if we think Can. there's a threat? What if we think we're, there's a way to convince yes. them? Are there so, ways that you found Max? Yes. Yeah, so let's start with the spouse. Um, so how can you get your spouse involved or at least preparing with you in some way, shape, or form? And, and preparing is such such a cliche yeah, word. Yeah, I hate using anyway. the word prepping, it. but it's easy but, to use. But it, it's easy to use. So um, for me personally, um, you know, my wife was – My wife. <laughs> my wife. Um, she was – uh, she understood the need to have a gun in the house. She did not understand the need to have a gun on your person. Like she was like, that's a little too much. Um, and she just had, we had a very real life situation where I was like, okay, I need to explain this to you. Um, and you it was, mansplained it. No, I didn't. 
Um, I told Listen her, here, woman. Yeah. Hey, this is what you're doing. No. Um, <laughs> you're going to do this from yes. now on for these reasons. Let she, me give you an eight point <laughs> bullet or eight bullet points about yes. this thing. Um, she, uh, she used to be a pet sitter and she used to do walks. And she had this one particular client that wanted her dog walked at 9 p.m., like 9 p.m. Um, and she had a very specific and, – and a lot of these people, like, they're very specific about when, where, how, whatever. So there was this, like, little walking path near them. And it was a mile track. But three-quarters of that mile track was in heavy woods. Heavy woods with no lights of any kind. And heavy woods that were in, right next to a highway. Mm-hmm. And what I told her was, like, think about this. Like, you are about three quarters of a mile where you would have to try and get help. That would be almost – there's no way you could you could get anyone to pay attention to what was going on. I said, you're in a situation where you're completely helpless. You need to do something so that if something were to happen, you would at least be able to reasonably defend yourself. And that was a, an awakening for her because it became real for her in her head. And that's the key, I think. Like if we try and tell them these, you know, the things that go through our head, the best, in my opinion, the best way to do it is to make it real for them. Like your ch their children, like most women are going to viciously want to defend their children. If you present the children as, okay, you're doing this to protect them – I think it's a way more – it's a more visceral way for them to relate to it. And I think it's something that you have to relate to them. If you can't relate to their situation, if you can't relate to what they're what they're going through, if you can't relate to what they're wearing, all the things that, it, that, that they're dealing with as being a woman or a wife or a mother, I think you're going to have a very hard time or an impossible time getting most women to, like, check in on it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was that was that was kind of the key for me, that moment of like, OK, this is what I want to I want to I want to propose this to you. And it was a way for her to see it and acknowledge it and be like, OK, you know what? We need to do something about this. Yeah, I hear you. The um, you know, I, <laughs> I have not found a lot of success in the hey, let's talk about this situation to uh, to to analyze it. Like, cause that's how my brain works. Like mm -hmm. I try to like, oh, well let's, I'm going to look through this through different facets and, um, which is kind of like what you mm -hmm. did. Like, Hey, let's, let's analyze it. Right. Um, I've not found that to be fruitful. I find it to be a little bit, uh, like in my relationship to be, um, more about, uh, encouraging the positivity side. Mm -hmm. Um, just cause people have different motivations. Yeah, Some people just don't want to be like. Um, like pointed out that they did something wrong or that they weren't thinking about certain things or that they weren't considering the, the bad stuff. Cause uh, honestly, a lot of people, f you know, just respond bit poorly to criticism or, or mm -hmm. like, you know, being pointed out that, uh, that they haven't been thinking about these well, things. So it's like, you know, I, I've found that like, you know, the, 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 the softer approaches, um, not, and I, I don't really do these actively. I, I, I'm very lucky that I've found a, a partner that is, um, uh, she, she shares the same core values. Mm -hmm. So it's very like, we can, we can often just like talk about how, like ways to approach it as, as opposed to me having to convince her of, of much. Right. Um, so that's, that's, I'm very lucky in that sense. Um, but uh, but highlighting things that we could do that would make things better mm -hmm. um, usually helps. So like um, and, and and they they compound each other over time, too. So oh, it's yeah. like especially, um, you know, I think the the big change, the the easiest time to really start um, like like addressing those things, like becoming more prepared together is is children. Like 100%. before, before that, like, yep. the, you know, the world's your oyster, you know, you're, you're young, you're, you have very little response. The only person that you're worrying about is like the other, like the other person in the relationship. If that, if that. um, so, uh, that's a hard time to start changing things. Mm -hmm. But when you become a parent and you yes. start realizing, oh, we have to prepare for this thing. All of a sudden you, you've, all, all the compasses have now aligned to true North. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's a great time to, to do it. Um, 
And uh, so like that's that's where we 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 changed a lot. So like every like a lot of aspects of life of uh, and not just preparation, but like uh, I would consider it to be like uh, things that are uh, proactive uh, in terms of making the family more prepared or healthier. So like, you know, healthier choices and fitness and, um, you know, just making sure that we're generally more prepared every day. Yeah. Um, with having food on hand or, uh, actually I remember one of the big things I think that was a, there was a, a big shift in, in how we handled our household when, uh, when, when our daughter was born, shifting things to like, like simply just call like, you know, kind of saying like, Hey, do you think we should probably have like a month's worth of formula on hand? Yeah. Like, and it wasn't something that neither one, like either one of us had really like planned out beforehand, but it was just something that popped and, and all of a sudden it was like, yeah, that's important. Like, yeah, like we need to go have a stockpile of formula. Cause I think there was like, I'll admit there like, was a shortage. I wish at one I, point. well, yeah, but I wish I had had the foresight to it because there were a couple of times when we were on formula and like, it was like, oh, well, do we have any formula left? Yeah. We, we got a couple of scoops left yep. in that thing. And then you go, what if I can't get more? Yeah. Like, and of course that puts me down the rabbit hole of like, oh, I need to learn how to make formula or like <laughs> emergency baby rations and stuff. <laughs> um, and then thought, you know what? It's going to be a lot easier if we get a Costco membership and, and then, just buy and a, I just, buy, yes. I, I buy, you know, put out a big expense and, hey. you know, buy it on credit, but like, that's important. And then like, you could always absorb that cost later. Cause it's not like the shit goes bad, but like, um, you know, the, those things, having those conversations and then aligning on the, Hey, this is a, and then like, you know, basically, um, rolling off of that, like, Hey, we did that thing. Remember we did that thing with the baby, the, the formula, we should probably do that with baby food and we should probably do that with food, food, maybe food, food. And like, Oh, well, this is, this is kind of rolling into how we think about how to prepare our house. And then when it got to a point of like, we've got a good number of things prepared and we've got some emergency food, like things that we can grab and go in case. And then we have food that's long-term like, okay, well, what do we do now? Well, how about we start incorporating like all this leftover produce that like our family grows in the garden? Okay, well let's start canning that. So yeah. it just naturally progressed to being a kind of prepared preparedness mindset. But um, it was a journey together. So like, but those things, and this is the point I wanted to make is like, those are kind of crafty ways into yes. the the training side of it. Because once you start realizing that like as a, as a family and as a, as a partner, you're, you're aligned on like, Hey, preparedness is important. It's a lot easier to have the conversation mm -hmm. over here to like, Hey, you know, what's important in that preparedness stuff is security and medical me like you know like your own personal protection and then that you know sometimes that little nudge then gets them going like oh i should start thinking about that more and Whoa. be open to it and like um because honestly the what i have found the hardest hurdle to overcome um wasn't any of the home stuff any of the things that you could do around the house any of the like even having firearms in the home, that wasn't a hard conversation for us. Like that was, that was all natural. Um, the hardest part was the convincing to go to a class, yeah. like to experience that thing, to like basically become vulnerable, vulnerable to whatever it is that people feel is they are vulnerable to at classes. And I mean, for me, like, uh, you know, I had, I listened, I found in my life that at the time, especially listening to James was a good idea. Um, it just, he gave, he gave good advice. Um, and him, him and Caleb both said, Hey, you know, medical is kind of the, that's, that's kind of the secret sauce because she comes down here. It's not about firearms, but there's a little bit of that in there. Um, and so my wife's first class was immediate action medical. Meaning that, that. Con like, you know, enticing yes. her yes. into taking a medical class, yes. the non-fighty part yes. was an easier conversation into yes. a learning environment. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, um, and and now that being said, you know, she took a media action two years ago, maybe more. 
Um, and she still has not taken a pistol class yet. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other things around that. Um, but you know, again, sometimes all it takes is getting that foot in the door and showing them that, that peak of like, okay. And it opens the mind up to the possibility of, okay, well, you know what, if I'm doing this, I really should do this. And one thing kind of builds on the next. I mean, like Jamie, your partner, Jamie carries more than a lot of guys I know. Oh yeah, she carries. I mean that. Like, I'm I mean, very proud. I mean, of, I mean like, like, like I would call that a huge success, and I would be willing to bet that amongst our people that we know and their spouses, probably more diligently than most. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, you know? so I, I, I make no bones about the fact that my wife's awesome. Like, I she just is don't awesome. tell her that. She'll probably hear it when she Jamie, listens to the podcast. You're awesome. Um. <laughs> but uh like I'm I'm super proud of the fact that she takes that seriously. Yeah. But that all came from like our journey through it together. And like what I will say is exposure to that way of thinking mm-hmm. is what helped solidify it for her. Cause she would see me when I was, you know, um when so like th- where that journey started, Jamie and I, neither one of us had a background in family that cared at all about guns Mm -hmm. or safety or, or, you know, like critical thinking or not critical thing. Like that's, that's not, um, not an accurate representation of our families, but, um, that, that, uh, you know, like the defense focus, you're not your own, you're not your own first responder. Right. Exactly. Um, nobody ever thought about that stuff growing up. Um, I was exposed to it, um, and brought it home and, was a zealot about it and, but like trying to not be the guy that was like overbearing about the whole thing, but I probably was, I absolutely was like, that's not, it's (laughs) like, I totally was. And like, Hey, we got to do this. I got to get more guns. We got (laughs) to be prepared do all this stuff. Like they're coming. Like I, there was all, all types of stuff going through my head at the time, but she saw that, saw me go through that together. And I will say that I think the most important side of it was, um, like doing that journey together so that she saw the things that influenced me, like watching the videos that, that, or, you know, seeing the personalities that influenced me like Jaeger. Yeah. Like, um, but far more than that, because that was just kind of the, the, the initial steps. It was, um, exposure to people in this, that think this way. Yeah. Um, that, you know, do have a good head on their shoulders that, normalize because honestly that's really all we're talking about here is that carrying a gun every day is so foreign to most people yeah uh that they you know it, it's if if somebody who grew up in a in a third world country who has no idea what a fire extinguisher is they would have no they if you showed them a fire extinguisher and said hey you should have this in your home every time you cook they'd go uh yeah okay like i'll just Whatever. Like yeah. they, they don't understand what it is. They don't understand the importance or, or the, the repercussions of not having it. So when you normalize it, like now we live in a country in a world where every home basically has a fire extinguisher in it. I would think you're irresponsible and crazy for not having a fire extinguisher in the kitchen of your home. I think you're irresponsible and crazy if you don't have a fire extinguisher in every room of your house. Well, that that too. I mean, some people take it to more yeah. to more real like reasonable places. Yeah. I I carry one in my car. It has helped me twice. Um so like having those things on hand have become normalized. Right. To where like most other people they're like you have a, a fire extinguisher in your car? What are you? Like paranoid? Or they say, "Oh, you must go off roading." Or you, right. oh, you must be a volunteer fireman. Like, like, yeah. Like, no, I'm just a person. But it's easy to to stay in that mindset. One hundred percent. So when you when you like when you find, and this is where like the people that you run into in this world are so important and so influential and so critical to developing as a better person and as a better family is ex- like you know exposing your sp- spouse to those people. Yep. Um, so that they could see how other people like. Like, I mean, we now have a friends group where carrying a gun, like not carrying a gun is like odd. That's odd. Who because are we you? understand yeah. the repercussions of it. Or or the the the, the other media is like here. Like, yeah, like, like it's you, you, it's it's like breathe like you know, yeah. you should have like take yeah, here, this. Take this. And I like 
because the the stigma of it is completely 100 percent destigmatized like yeah. it's it's not there so it's just a tool that you hand around like huh? so exposure to that was the th- that was the key right over time and it's not one of those things where it's like you need to get on board with this right now and like you join like you need to go take a class and then your life will be changed like no it's not it, it doesn't work that way um which like, goes back to the idea of communication and knowing like if you're with someone and you're a partner in life, you need to figure out how to how to share your opinion on things, how to share what you believe in a way that she's actually going to not tune you out. You know what the great irony of this whole discussion is that we don't have our spouses here to tell people what actually was effective. You're listening to two fucking dudes yes. who think they know everything. Uh, talk about what they think was effective. Hey. And I guarantee you, if my wife was down here, she'd be like, no, it was this other thing. That was what actually, that was what changed my mind. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just, I'm full of shit. So. Well, I'm just going to continue <laughs> going on in my, in my disbelief. Okay, so, <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, like, right, yeah, no, yeah. no, I get it's, it. It's, okay, it's so, a one-sided conversation. So, so the next, okay, we talked about spouses, um, children. Now yours is still. She's very young. She's very young. Yeah. Um, I have found, well, two things. My oldest is 27. So I took her shooting frequently and she enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. My 15 year old has no interest in shooting. Like, like if anything, it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, my son is nine. He enjoys doing it. Well, he's a boy. I mean, boys are made to breed, burn and break things. Um, but, uh, what I am very happy about is my daughter through a lot of pain and misery at first is in scouts. And it was definitely at the beginning, it was dragging her to meetings to a point where at one point I was like, Hey, like you need to decide if you want to do this or not. I'm not going to drag you through this for the next however many years. Like you need to actively make a decision that you want to do this or I'm done. Mm -hmm. Um, But through scouts, it has opened her, 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 her mind and her thoughts to that being prepared. To the point where my daughter, no matter where she goes, she has a bleed kit in either her school bag or in her bag that she carries with her. Right. So she has devoted a a, a thing that's you know bigger than the phone here in a bag that has very limited space, and she still that it's important enough that she's got that in her bag, and that one hundred percent is because of scouts, one hundred percent. Because if they did not have the the diligence of um, the medical training for the month of March and before and after and didn't drill that into their kids' heads. And I was not given the opportunity to bring like scenarios to the kids, which I do and I have. Um, if it wasn't for that, I don't think that she would be of that. That opened her mind to it. Mm-hmm. And the fact that now she is the one of the youngest uh SPLs for the for the for the MYLT, which is National Youth Leadership Training Program. Um, she's one of the youngest they've ever had. To me, that's that for me, that's like well, there's a lot of things that go into that too. But like but, but it just it, it has it she's changed and she's matured and through scouts and through the program and everything, we were lucky enough to have very good leaders um at the beginning and even now for her, um, it has definitely opened her eyes to it. And she looks at things differently than she did before. But if it wasn't for that, I don't know that me on my own could have done as good a job getting her, her, her mind open to those ideas. Well, I will say that, uh, scouts is a good tool. Um, I, I certainly benefited from it like my whole life Mm -hmm. from, from using that structure, that program. Um, that's why, my daughter's in the program now as a cup scout and why I find a lot of value in it. But what I'll say is, um, it's just a tool. Like mm-hmm. I'm sure you would have six, like, cause like, what you're saying is, Hey, I've found a tool that helped me yes. like instill values into my daughter that I find mm-hmm. like, you know, that I align mm-hmm. with. And, uh, I have no doubt that that would have been the case if you found 4-H or like some some other tool. Right. Like there's other effects. I'm not. I'm, I just don't want to discount the other things. Scouts is a great program because it does, um, it does reiterate some of those those. In my opinion, the biggest, most important thing that it that it emphasizes, if you do it correctly, is personal responsibility. Yep. 
Um, I will say that as a kid, um, I, I probably did not get enough reinforcement of that in my life outside of scouts. So it did not like that wasn't a lesson I really took on until my twenties. Like when I, when I became like a, like an adult. So, um, that was something that, uh, that's been big for me in terms of like, so Lizzie's, uh, at an age where, um, like it's, uh, you know, like I don't, I'm not trying to put the tools of the trade in her hands. Oh, no. Like I'm she's, not trying to she's teach her way too young at shooting this point. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. medical stuff or all these other things, but it's exposure to the idea and reinforcement mm-hmm. of personal responsibility and, like, and, and in every yeah, aspect, yeah, like, yeah. Hey, picking up after yep. yourself and, you know, being on time and the, th- the lessons that like, you know, I'm basically trying to give her the cheat sheet of like oh these are the these were the end benefits of me learning to take personal responsibility seriously mm-hmm. and like we're just going to emphasize those all the time um and hopefully that'll that'll backfill into like that kind of core value yeah i th- i think i think you know planting those seeds only is ever going to pay dividends even if it's at a young age where the maturity level is not there to be able to really appreciate what it is that she's being shown. I think those seeds will one hundred percent. I mean, it, it can't it can't do harm. It can only do good. Yeah, I, it's just and it's it it's you know to your point and kind of the the you know bringing it around to whatever the theme of this part of the conversation is. It's like what are the ways to get your kids involved? Um, well, I, I for me it starts at home because. I don't have some grand plan of like, oh, well, this year I'm going to I'm going to teach her how to shoot. Yeah. And this year I'm going to teach her how to how to do like a tourniquet. I wish year. I had that plan. Um, <laughs> I almost some wish people I did. do. And they they really they like, you know, they, they take a lot of pride in that. I don't have it. I'm it's one of those things of like, I feel like the, the opportunity will present itself to me when I think that she's ready to do those things. She may never be. Right. But like reiterating and introducing the idea of the core values Mm -hmm. of, well, you know, honestly, if I really have to dig into it, like learning to shoot and, and being defensively minded, um, is, is not the, is not the core value. No, the core value is personal responsibility. And, um, in, in my, my belief, it's really about the idea of, of how would I, how would I describe it? Um, not just personal responsibility, but, um, I guess teamwork, like, you know, the shared values you have with your family, like those things are the things that are important to uphold and to, and to, to, to make sure endure. So like those two things together, like your responsibility, and then, you know, the, the fulfillment and the security slash, um, uh, uh, success of the, of your family mm-hmm. that those are the things that, yeah, that are important. So wherever I can, I'm instilling, like I'm trying to focus on those things. Um, and then the other stuff will fall into place. I, I won't be upset if she's like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to learn to shoot. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to try and encourage you to, cause I think it's important, but it's not, I'm not going to be like, Oh, well, you need to learn you need to take this pistol class or I'm not, you know, like some people get upset about those things or like, um, you know, like, and and honestly, a lot of it is uh, finding ways to like sneaky teach Mm -hmm. things. Like we have this, um, like Nerf guns, like if she's using Nerf guns, it's like, Oh, well, you know, it's a really easy way to get like the mindset instilled in your kids, like coach them through, like the four firearm safety rules with a nerf gun. with a nerf gun. And I'm not saying like sit them down and then teach no. those things. Like if they're playing, be like, Hey kid, keep your finger straight off the trigger when you're moving. And they go, Oh, okay. And they, they keep their finger straight when they're moving or like, Hey, whenever you move that thing around, don't, don't have that muzzle point at anything. You're not willing to destroy. Imagine a big lightsaber coming out of it. And they're like, look, daddy, I'm not doing the lightsaber. Like mm-hmm. I'm not touching it. And like, awesome job. Like, you know, it's, or, or even a simple thing. Like you don't want to shoot mommy. Yeah. Like you want to shoot me. So don't point the gun don't, at mommy. Yeah, don't point it at things that you want. So like, yeah. you know, finding the sneaky ways to like instill some of the, some of yeah. the skills and values, but not making it like a, a chore or, or, or a, a lesson. Yeah. You know, this is not um, going to be a long speech. Like I was lucky with my oldest. Like she was very interested in it. Um, She wanted to go do it Uh, with 15 year old. 
Like, and that's fine. It, the reality is, is that, you know, it's just as important for them to see you doing the things and being diligent and disciplined as it is for them to do it. Yeah. Because the reality is, is whether they realize it or not, or whether you realize it or not, they are giant sponges and they are absorbing all those things. Yeah. And it's the same principles that, that apply everywhere in terms of leadership of like, if you want your kid to be on time, show them what it's like to be on time. Yep. If you want your kid to clean up after themselves, clean up after yourselves. Like, and, and and make it a point to yeah. say, hey, look, we're cleaning up together and this is what we do. And then it becomes that becomes the thing instead of it being like, oh, well, I didn't do like, you know. And and, and for me, like I, I'm brutal, like I am brutal with my kids. Like uh, it doesn't mean that I don't love them. I don't care. We don't play. But like there's a certain amount of like uh, brutal responsibility, like you are responsible for this thing. You need to get it done. There's no wiggle room. There's no flexibility in certain things. And I think that's important. I, there's certain things they have to understand is, is like, there's no compromise here. It is what it is. And and that doesn't work for every kid. And that doesn't work for every parent. I, it's worked for me. Um, but again, like it, it, it's going to, it's going to be different for every family. Every, every family dynamic is going to be different. Um, you know, like the dynamic I have with my son is completely different because he's half the time in a different household. Mm -hmm. You know, all I can do is try and reinforce those things when he's under my supervision and, and for split families, that's tough. It is. Yeah. You know, so, but I, I think any tool you can find, like you said, it could be anything. It could be a baseball practice. It could be ba- a baseball team where they have to be on time and show up for, for practice on time and do all the practice and all the things they have to do to be able to be, perform when the game time comes. Like all these things can be used as tools to try and reinforce in your kids that the only person that ultimately is responsible for them is them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, I would say the 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 important follow up to that is while you're showing them those those values and um and it's like I I don't I I'm totally not an authority on on any of this because I'm I'm like I'm a I'm just a dad trying to figure this thing out too but this is the way I think about it like following up those those opportunities to learn the values with like hey we're we're going like there she's going to see me do things like and and participate in things and normalize things and you know bring that through in a daily life um and then try to take those opportunities to then bring her into the things that you hope that mm-hmm. that they want to participate in like go into the range like there will be a time where i'm like hey you want to come to the range with dad you know and just you know trying that every now and then to see if there's a a, a good point to bring them into the actual activities that we hope that they get yeah. involved with or, you know, uh, it, it could be one of those things where she just, you know, really gets into canning with mom or right. growing. It growing doesn't matter what it is with, with grandpa. Like um, those are those are all important and yep. it doesn't matter which one. They all lead to the same place. So, yeah, like for me, it was the medical seems to work with my with my middle child. Like it's she latched onto it. Yeah. So like whatever they're going to latch on to, like, like exploit that <laughs> to exploit it as much as you possibly can, because let's face it, the, the worst part of this whole thing is we get maybe if you're lucky, 18 years, that's it. That's all you have. Mm-hmm. Like that's your core time. Some people say it's even shorter than that. Like that's your amount of time that you have for your children to get them ready for the world. And it's a terrifying prospect, especially when you're, when you're 15 years in and you realize like I only have three years left <laughs> potential, you know, it could be longer, could be shorter, but like, you know, that's like the normal age where they kind of go off into their own, you know, world. So, yeah. All right. So we've talked about yeah. spouses. We've yes. talked about kids. Yes. Um, what about, and I think we'll end here because I don't think we actually have to spend that much time on it. Cause I have a very kind of <laughs> focused view on this one. <laughs> what about friends, people that you think that, that, are values to you, but you're not necessarily like, you know, they're not, um, you're not responsible for them. Um, like, have you had success in getting people to come training that, that were no, from? No, no. If, any, if anything, uh, being around 
gun guys that were like your friends before you started training and taking this seriously, it's almost painful to have a conversation after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. I have had way more success making mm -hmm. friendships um, with people that are already involved. I honestly, like, like if I can, if I can think of friends that I had, no, I'm sorry. One in one in, in, in particular is different. Um, he, but he already had that, that headset on it, on his head. Um, other than him, no, I mean, not, not a fucking one. I have, um, I have one friend, very, you know, very good friend of mine. Somebody I am like, he is my brother. And if he called, yep. I would, I would be there. Like it's no questions asked. Like I'm, I'm going, I, he needs me. Um, he's not, he's not into this world. Yep. Like I, and I, he's the only person that I've ever convinced to kind of take a class once. Right. Um, and that's fine. Like, I mean, you, it's easy to get frustrated with the idea of like, oh, my friends don't share my values or like they don't view this as important as I do. Um, and like sometimes it takes a while to go, oh, that's that's OK. Like you don't have to like cast people out because they don't share those things um, and you don't it have just, to like cut them. You know, you don't have to yeah. like, you know, ignore them. It's just one of those things of like, OK, well, they're not they're not into this thing. Um, but still living the way that you do, it's kind of like the way you do with the, like the way I view kids is like, I'm just, I'm going to live my life in this way. It gets harder and yeah. harder to like, I find it has gotten harder and harder and harder to continue those relationships, even the ones that I've wanted to mm -hmm. only because more and more of my life revolves around people that are, that are of this mindset. Um, and like, I mean, there is, there is a factor. I mean, I will admit there is a frustration, uh, that exists when like I am around older friends that don't share this kind of core value, mm -hmm. like this, the, the kind of defense mindset. Um, but you know, it's like, there's also a growth factor there in terms of being able to go, all right, well. I don't have to focus on that all the time because there's there's meaningful relationships that you can sure. have with people that aren't oh, no, no. based on that. Like, so, I, I, I but that took me a while to yeah, get there. Like, like, like I, it wasn't right away that I felt that. I, I I don't feel the need to cast people out, but I have found that you know, with between kids and scouts and and this and all these things, like I have a finite amount of time, and you know, like. Every year, m m most, if not all, of my vacation time is burnt up training. Mm -hmm. um, and I have found that I have less and less time to be able to devote to those people. And it's not that they've done anything wrong. It's not that I have any, 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 any want or need to cast them out. It's just the reality of there's 24 hours in a day, there's seven days in a week, and 365 days in a year. And I just... If I'm going to use time, I want to use time productively as much as possible. Um, like I used to watch NASCAR. <laughs> like, you used to watch NASCAR? I used to watch NASCAR. I was a huge mm. Dale Earnhardt fan. Um, Multicam Tropic Dale Earnhardt jacket. Ooh. That's I never, future Christmas yeah. gift. Um, but like, but like, <laughs> like, I can't even think of the last time I sat and watched the sports. I used to watch football. Mm -hmm. Like I just – I just – I don't, I don't have the time because the time is is valuable and it's it's short. It's there there there's a there's a huge value to that time and like I just I just don't feel the need to you know devote that time to that. Uh, I can uh, you, you know, know I I I feel you. Um, what I will say is there's a bit of an excuse in there. Like in terms of like, oh, oh yeah. there's not enough time because like if if you found something to be a priority, you'd make the time. But, for but it. that's the thing is is like is like it's just. But you just don't find it to be a priority, no. which is fine. Like yeah. that's, um, you know, it's it's what we have to do as adults. Now, you know, are you like, can we pick apart everything in the in the, in Max's calendar and be like, hey, well, did you have to do that? Like, I, no, like we we're not going to do that because, like, really, at the end of the day. It's it's saying, well, that's not a it's not a priority for me to associate or to to devote time to this, you know, to this relationship. And like, 
you know what? There are some times where even recreation, even if you did say, oh, I watched a couple of hockey games this week or like, you know, I watched some NASCAR. I'm not, you know. No, so yeah. You need that too in your yeah. life sometimes. Like I'm not, you know, yeah. people who are like, their recreation is. That's what vampire shows are yeah, for. Like, <laughs> or Game of Thrones. <laughs> um <laughs> Like I'm not I, that. That's that's the point I wanted to make. Is like or you don't you good, don't you or don't. a good daily session of D and D. Hey, I can get behind that. But um, you don't have the the schedule doesn't have to be packed from 4 a.m. No, to, to 11 p.m. for you to have to go. Well, you know, I I I'm not making time. It's it's okay to not make time for that. Um, or for for you know actively pursuing relationships that aren't priorities yeah like that and that's i think what it comes down to is that's the um that's that took me a while to learn and like that's that's it's hard to do yeah. and uh, and that's kind of like my my summation of like friends that don't want to train like i try to I try to be a good resource for people that i think might be interested in mm-hmm. in understanding the world that we do better but at the end of the day, um, I'm not going to devote time, energy, and resources into trying to convince people to come take classes. Yeah, no. Or to change their way of thinking because it, really the reality is that they – like I don't have an – like um, I'm not responsible for them and they're not responsible for me. So – it's okay for me to go, okay, well, you know what? You know where I stand. If you ever need it, I'm here, but yeah. we're not going to, like, I'm just not going to keep trying to push on yeah. this thing. So, um, I mean, the first, very, yeah, you got to listen, like yeah. back to that first point we made of like, you got to understand how to recognize when somebody is not ready for, or yes. not is closed off to change and you go, all right, well, let's just don't even bother. I mean, the first time I met you was entirely geared Towards getting this group of people that I knew better prepared. Oh, yeah. And with the subject of radios. And at least out of that, I got to meet you. Because (laughs) really, that's the only thing, the only thing that really came out of that that moment was, was meeting you, becoming your friend, and meeting the other people that are around you. Like, that's it. Because the intention behind the class and the purpose of the class went pew <laughs> crash and burn yeah well i mean but that's yeah you know that's what we do we yeah. try we and that's a noble effort to try and organize people into being better prepared as a group and i will tell you i have not <laughs> i've i wish i been with people, far more successful yeah, even with people that are of our mindset it is it's rough very rough but um but yeah, yeah. so I think uh, I think we've kind of covered the yeah. covered the the topic. I mean, the main thing is, uh, you know, if just ke- I, I think with it with your spouse, it's finding that avenue. With your kids, I think it is even if they show no interest, <laughs> e- whether you realize it or not, they're watching. Um, I, I I I didn't realize mine was watching, and she was, um, and now she's doing the things, and so like whether you realize or not that your kids are watching, like be that example, even if they're not actively saying, Hey, that's cool. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, with friends, do what you can with family, do what you can just understand that sometimes you got to cut your losses. Yep. Even if that's painful. Sometimes it is painful, but you know, you, uh, what you need to do is just constantly send them the, 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 the upcoming month's calendar from (laughs) bulletin.net. (laughs) <laughs> no. <laughs> These are the classes over the next month in your in your in your zip code a week later. These are the classes. Yeah, I don't <laughs> it's funny like if somebody could figure out how to bottle like and uh I you know like the 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 things that got us interested um like the 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 personalities, the the circumstances of of how those things magically come into play to like convince somebody to do training, man, that person would make tens of dollars. Like, yes, I, like least, there's not a lot of money to be made in the training tens world, tens of dollars. Um, but man, they would be maybe some free there swag. Would, there would be so many people who love that guy. Yes. Um, hopefully someday we will crack that code. 
of I mean, uh, we know a few people that are pretty influential and convincing when they want to be. Yeah, well, I think it's a collective effort, right? Like we all try what we do, like what we can to to convince people that you know what we do is important. Like what, like, and what, what I'll say is not even what we do or what like we can do. It's what that person who hears the message is capable of doing. Yeah. Like them improving their lives, them being the first responder for their lives. Um, that's, so, that's so, so there's, convincing them to yeah. get that, to, you know, there's one piece of advice when it comes to this is whatever you can do, make it bite-sized. Like, yeah, don't, it's true. if yeah. you give someone the big picture, they're going to see this tsunami wave that they have to deal with versus saying, Hey, you know, this week, uh, we bought five cans of peas. How about next week we buy five more? Mm-hmm. Like the simple, and then what they see is they will see the accumulation after a short period of time. Be like, oh, this doesn't have to be all at once. And I think if you can make it bite sized, it makes it way, oh, yeah. way easier. Yeah. To deal make with. things achievable for people. Yep. That's that's kind of a general rule. Yep. But um, but yeah. So I think that uh, yep. that kind of wraps it up for us tonight on the Berm Limits podcast. Our discussion topic, our stories. Um, Talk about the episode, write some comments if yep. you are so inclined. Let us know how we're doing, what you like, what you dislike. Um, We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we want to hear from you. What has been successful for you? How Did you crack the code? We'd love to know of how to get people involved in training. So um, comment on the video. Come join us over at the Bulletin Community on Facebook. Please and do. Until next time, get smart, stay ready, find training. See you later, guys.